You are listening to Perplexity. On June 12, 1962, three men would make history by escaping the unescapable. Located just outside San Francisco, California, also known as The Rock, this maximum federal security prison was designed to house the worst of the worst. It has been labeled the most secure prison, surrounded by freezing waters with strong current and requiring a one to two mile swim to get to land. In 1861, it was a residence for military offenders. Later, prisoners would include Hopi Indians from the Arizona Territory, who passively resisted government attempts to assimilate them, and American soldiers fighting in the Philippines who had joined the Filipino cause. In 1907, it would be designated for the Pacific Branch of the U.S. military prison, and by 1934, they began to accept dangerous criminals. The prison was known for holding big names, Al Capone, Machine Gun Kelly, not to be confused with the mediocre artist, Robert the Birdman Stroud, and many others. From the time the prison was in operation, it would house about 1,500 prisoners, 36 of which would make 14 separate attempts to escape. But according to records, none were successful either drowning, being captured, or killed. But it seems like this was not the case for three men, two that were brothers, John and Clarence Anglin and Frank Morris. Their alleged escape has baffled the public for over six decades. So let's get into it. This is the story of the 1962 Alcatraz Escape Conspiracy. and welcome back to another episode of Perplexity, a mystery podcast. As always, I am your host, Kadra, and if you're new here, hello and welcome. I tell tales every single week that have perplexed me. So if you love a good mystery that leaves you wanting more, don't worry, you're in the right place. And I would love if you follow along if you enjoy. And if you are a returning listener, hello, my friends. Welcome back. So happy you're here. I am so happy that I have other people joining me today. I have a very special or two very special guests. I have Amanda and Trevin from the Live Laugh Larceny podcast. Woohoo! Thank you so much for having us. We're so excited. Yeah, I saw your I've been seeing your videos for some time and I was like, hey, I want to be a part of one of these things. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Yeah, I think yeah, you had given videos. me a thank you. You'd given me a really nice compliment, I think, on like a doppelganger video I did. So that was very nice. Yeah, I always uh what do I, I always look up to people who can do a lot of video because I try to a man and I try to split it together and it's hard to keep up with. And it's I'm a lot. Just, I'm not quick at it. I can do audio all day, but video is a whole nother thing for me. Video is a whole other ball game for sure. I also have to give credit where credit is due. My boyfriend TJ makes my reels for me. I do not make those, oh. but I like I splice the clips together and I write the short scripts for them. And then he does like all the editing for it. So shout out TJ. <laughs> Major props to TJ. That is amazing. Yeah, that, that's really nice of you to do. Yeah, he's self-taught. So we just started doing that. <laughs> We're figuring it out. And we use Adobe Premiere and they've got some cool features on there. So Ooh, okay. very cool. Also, I want to let everybody know, because I know Trevin said he could hear thunder. It is storming really bad where I'm at mm. having Internet issues. So this is going to be a stormy episode. I'm I'll try to edit out the storming as best I can. But sorry if y'all hear that. Hopefully it just adds to the Vena <laughs> <laughs> I'm I, into it. It is for me. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, well, for those of you who are not familiar with Trevin and Amanda, they host, like I said, Live Laugh Larceny, and it is such a fun podcast. Do you guys want to talk about your podcast for a minute before we get started? I just want to let you guys plug it really quick because I love your podcast. Oh, you're so kind. No, we love our show. We have so much fun doing it each and every week. 
Um, but Live Laugh Larceny is a true petty crime podcast. So Trevin and I, when we first decided to come up with our show, I was more the traditional true crime lover. Trevin was more the co comedian lover, the comedy and satire and things like this. And it kind of just came together in a random phone call conversation that Trevin and I had where we would switch it up and talk about petty crimes in a more serious tone. Um, and then Trevin, of course, is an audio master who does all of our original music. We do funny sound effects with our stories. Um, and it's kind of like, what did you call it, Trevin? A, um, a variety show? Yeah, it's like a variety show. Uh, I also pitched my or pitched our show to a bunch of audio drama people who just listen to the long form stories where it's all sound effects and everything. And they called us an anthology, which makes sense because I always call us like a comedy twilight zone and that's an anthology. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to decide if I'm going to start pitching the word anthology in there for our show sometimes now too. But yeah, it's a variety show where we start with a little bit. We have like a designed beginning for our banter where we just, make a joke about something that we find very dreadful in our lives. We have a fact segment to make people feel like they're a little more smarter in conversation. And then we have our stories, which is the bulk of every episode where we take dumb criminal stories or just petty stories between people. And we build them into these audio drama short stories, almost like a dateline coverage or if you like horror podcasts, sort of a radio rental style, but all in a comedy, um, naked gun kind of satire way. Exactly. I, it's so fun. I, the first thing I thought when I listened to y'all's podcast is how unique it is. I, I love that it has like the true crime and the comedy element together, but in a different way. Cause I feel like there's a lot of true crime comedy podcasts. So I love like the dramatization, the sound effects. I didn't know you did original music for it. So that's really cool. Uh, the first 100 episodes, I think were all original songs by me. And then as I got a little more into experimenting, that's when I started working with um, what is it called? Epidemic Sound. It's a royalty free for like sound effects and music. And I've broadened my horizons now. And now that I am using other people's like royalty free music, I am able to do stuff that I could, couldn't really do. Like now I can do really emotional, like looking back stories with beautiful piano in the background because I was always very limited in my piano skills. So now I can really switch it up with genres. And it's been it's it's kept me very excited to work on every week because there's just so many different feelings I can put into stories now that I have all of those different palettes or all the different colors on my palette now. I love being able to do like the creative process in podcasting. So that, that's really cool. And that's like another avenue of it that I hadn't thought about. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that's the thing I like about podcast is it really is a creative medium. And I think a lot of the people that are leading the industry right now are people who don't necessarily take advantage of the medium you know it's pretty much just comedians bullshitting a bunch and a lot of people want to listen to them but like it's still it's no different to me it's just you know like a movie or something like that you can really focus on the art and really dive in and do a lot more with it and you know, why don't we have more things with a higher production value like that? It's not just audio dramas that should be able to do it. I'm a, I don't know if you ever listened to American Hysteria, but they do a really good job, almost like PBS documentary style sort of learning stuff. And I just love that, that, you know, going a little step further in it instead of just being like, oh, I'm listening to voices talk. It's just, you can do a lot more with the medium and express yourself in so many more ways. It's, it's still an art medium. It's not just radio, you know? Definitely. Well, I want to thank my friend Ryan for recommending our story today. And again, it is raining so loud. I am so I sorry. I can hear that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Are you okay? Yeah, I think so. It's supposed to hail, but later tonight. So no hail until tonight. I'm keeping an eye on the, the weather on my phone too. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we're good. <laughs> As always, uh, sources that were used for today's episode will be down in the show notes. Podcast isn't for children. We might be cussing, but no other really triggers for today. So let's get into the Alcatraz escape.
So Frank Morris arrived at Alcatraz in January of 1960. He had been convicted of bank robbery, burglary, and other crimes. He also had a known history of uh, making repeated attempts to escape other prisons. He was known as an escape artist. They purposefully put him in Alcatraz, hoping that he would not be able to escape there because no one else had been successful in it. So why not put him there? And later that same year, John Anglin would arrive at Alcatraz, shortly followed by his brother Clarence in early 1961. Both of these men had also been convicted of bank robbery. So we've got three bank robbers, and turns out, they would find out later, they all had a history of being a flight risk. So it was a pretty silly idea to put all these men side by side in cell block B, but that is exactly what happened. Oh my goodness, yeah, that was not a well thought out plan. It's kind of like that that story we did about the uh, the one the one I did about the mobster, how they just put all these kids that were troubled together in a juvenile detention thing, and they all just became a mob from a much younger age, and they just worked together really well. Right. Exactly. And these men quickly became good friends, and pretty much as soon as they got into prison, like all three of them together, they immediately hatched an escape plan. And this plan would be put together over the course of a year. So it wasn't like a rushed thing. Like they very meticulously thought this out. And y'all will see more later of like how they put the whole plan together. But it's fascinating. Yeah, I was going to say a year. That's not a that's not a split decision. That's a year of planning. Yeah, that's how you know they're good at it. Exactly. I don't know if they had made made group attempt escapes in the past. Maybe the Anglin brothers had because, you know, they're brothers and they would kind of follow each other through prisons. But I know they all were flight risks. And Frank Morris would kind of become the lead in putting this plan together. He was known to be very intelligent, very cunning. And the three men also had help from another inmate, a man named Alan West, who I could not find a picture of, but he helped them as well. And they would just bide their time, plan everything, put everything together. In the early morning hours on June 12th, 1962, when it was time for bed check, just like any other morning, John Anglin, Clarence Anglin, and Frank Morris would not be found in their cells. Instead, prison guards would find, and this is amazing, cleverly built dummy heads made of makeshift plaster or paper mache, which had been constructed using homemade cement powder mixture, soap, toilet paper, flesh tone paint, and real human hair. I was just about to ask about the hair. I was like, how? Because I'm looking at the slideshow right now and I'm like, how? How did they do the hair? And honestly, they did great with the flesh tone too. Yeah, it bothered me so much, too, because there were like 10 different articles I read that were like, and real human hair and no explanation of how the hair got on there. It's like, did they cut their own hair? Did they put it? I need to know. So then I finally found one source that said they stole this hair from the barber shop that was in Alcatraz. Ooh, that's smart. I just assumed it was their own. I thought it was their own as well. They all kind of had the same color hair. It could have very well been too. Like maybe they got their hair cut in the barber shop and then they stole their own hair. But I just found it was from this barber shop. So pretty clever. Yeah, that makes it a lot less weird. It's not like you're just walking up to another prisoner and you're like, hey, time for a trim. <laughs> now, here's my question. Did they each make their own respective dummies or do you think they just put it in one person's hand to be like, you're the dummy guy. And he just did all three because I can see a lot of different expressions and and like just artistic visions between the three you know frank's a little piggy but john england's got a hell of a jaw on him and a great chin he could be a superman but then clarence he's very abstract he's got a little bit of a long face and only half of it i just noticed they also have eyebrows and eyelashes on them yeah the eyelashes is creepy the eyelash really guys i think was a little much 
it's a little much. And I think it scared one of the prison guards really badly because whenever they went to do the bed check, they basically had these dummy heads sticking out of their covers and their beds. And the cell guard grabbed like this long stick and went to poke one of the dummy heads. <laughs> Maybe he thought they were dead. I don't know. But then this caused one of the heads, I believe it was Frank Morris's, to roll onto the cell floor. And that caused the nose to be broken. So if, I don't know if you can tell in the photos, but the nose is kind of cracked. And that's because it landed on the floor. <laughs> wow. Could you imagine being that guard and you're like, that guy looks a little weird, kind of kind of suspicious with the eyelashes. I'm going to give him a little pokety poke and then... The head just comes right off. <laughs> it's just like a cartoon to me. This whole thing is like super Looney Tunes. That's why. That's part of why I love this story so much. It, yeah, I didn't even know that how that that's how this worked. So Amanda, uh, when you went to art art school, isn't that like an art practice to do a self portrait or something to kind of see how you see yourself? You have to do self portraits left and right in art school. I mean, I did a wire <laughs> head of myself. I did charcoal drawings, paintings, photographs, everything. They're like, okay, do a self-portrait. And it, yeah, uh, clearly these people have had a little bit of practice. So I feel like right before they pulled off this epic escape, they probably really got to know themselves very well. And it's important to know the kind of criminal you are before pulling such a big move. So I'm really invested. I love the idea of them having like this this inner monologue and like we have to first know ourselves before we can escape. <laughs> but you're probably right. They did need to know what they were doing, right? <laughs> and they have a little show and tell and they're just looking at each other's and like, oh, John. Why it took a year, okay? They had to do a lot of inner work. That's true. It's not a quick process, everybody. So after the men escaped, the prison would quickly go into lockdown and the guards would begin to search throughout the whole prison. They notified the warden, who then notified authorities and the U.S. military became quickly involved as well because they're in open waters. So they need to find these men quickly. But the men, we'd find out later, already had a 10 hour head start. Ooh, that's not bad. That's a great head start. Yeah. So the FBI would also be quickly notified. Their office in San Francisco checked for records on all of the missing prisoners. You know, what's their deal? And they would find they all had made previous escape attempts. They all were known flight risk. The men's relatives were also interviewed and their identification records were compiled. Then they would contact basically anybody on the water, like boat operators, and they would like give the men's description and be like, okay, be on the lookout for these three guys. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Yeah, so. it feels so obvious. Like I, I imagine all of them when they sign their name, like going into jail, they also signed, I'm going to escape. And everybody was like, hmm, I hope these guys don't escape. Yeah, one of them, I found like a little, I don't know if this was something someone made on the computer or if it's an actual like jail card, but I think it's Frank Morris in the photos. He has like a profile and then like they wrote this whole thing on him. I'll put all these photos in the Instagram, by the way, as usual for everyone listening, but they have like little profiles on all of them. And I feel like they should have just put in there like known escape artist or something. Yes. Yeah. Like, come on, guys. We couldn't have put a little extra security on them. Watched them a little bit more during arts and crafts time. Yeah. And you'll see more and more as I talk about this story. I'm like, I'm sorry. They deserved to escape because y'all clearly were not watching these men. It would be two days before authorities would find any type of clue as to where the men would have gone as well. So two days goes by and there's this packet of letters that they find. I'm not exactly sure where, but it was sealed in rubber and it was related to the men. I think it was like letters from family and stuff like that, that they had like sent to the men while they were in prison. So they were kind of keepsakes and they took them with them when they escaped. They also found paddles, like makeshift oars, if you will, for a boat and bits of rubber inner tubing. And this was all found near the freezing waters of the Pacific near Angel Island. And Angel Island is, I looked it up earlier today, it's 10 miles from Alcatraz. 
So obviously we don't know if like all of this, you know, kind of went to shore over that direction or what exactly happened, but a similar paddle would also be recovered at the prison. So it's like they were making and testing different ones and then they just took the ones that worked the best. (laughs) Oh my, you know, it's bad when they've made like options for this. Okay. They're like, we need to streamline these paddles a little more. We'll just leave the rest behind. There's so many supplies that they created, and it's all in the slides. It's hilarious, all the different tools they made. There was also a homemade life vest that they found at Cronkite Beach. So it seems like they stole these raincoats and they figured out how to inflate them and they like somehow sealed them shut. And so they had little life jackets in case they went into the water. But there's no sign of the men. These are all the things they found. See, working together, covering all their angles, they know themselves. (laughs) (laughs) And then eventually the investigation done by the FBI and the Coast Guard, the Bureau of prison authorities, they would start to piece the men's plan together. But this is largely because of Alan West. So Alan West was the other man that was helping them escape. He did not escape. He had to stay behind in the prison. And we'll talk about why later. But he drew the short stick. Yeah, Yeah, that's what I was thinking. (laughs) I was like, poor guy. Yeah. Nose goes. Yeah, nose goes. And he was supposed to escape with them, but he didn't make it out. And he ended up snitching on them. So he is largely why we know what their plan was, because he helped them plan it for over a year. Would it be a spoiler if you told me if he got stitches? (laughs) (laughs) I I do not know if he did or not. So no spoilers there. But I mean, he's in Alcatraz and I don't think they would have taken very kindly to snitches. So yeah, I'm with you. So according to Alan West, the group had been planning this escape since last December after they they came across some old saw blades using a homemade drill from the motor of a broken vacuum cleaner and spoons that they stole from the mess hall, the men figured out how to loosen the air vents located in the back of their cells, drilling closely spaced holes around the cover so that the entire section of the wall could be removed. And this would also require them getting through eight inches thick of concrete walls. They would hide the holes with whatever debris they had in their cells. So they were very persistent. (laughs) So they had a secret wall, a completely secret wall of like weapons and ores and all the things they used. So from what I gathered, the only thing that was in their cells were the little holes behind the air vents. But each of them had been digging at these holes for months and months and months. And then they would just cover them up with random debris. So they clearly were not doing cell checks and like um i can't remember what it's called but when they like go through and they're like turning everything over you know right not turnover service right yeah and it reminds me too have you guys seen the unlocked prison experiment that just came out on netflix i've heard of it but i've not watched it yet i have not no so it's this whole prison experiment that they're doing in um i think it's arkansas or georgia i can't remember which one but It's like people who are in their cells 23 hours a day, they're violent offenders. And the whole experiment is what happens if we unlock the cells for a few weeks and we actually treat these people as human beings. We keep the guards out um, and we just monitor them 24 seven on camera. And what ends up happening is a couple of the men skip ahead if you don't want spoilers and you guys want to watch this but a couple of the men decide that they just want to like party it up and they make like hooch uh like wine in the toilets yeah they make like joints out of like coffee um like or paper towels that they dip in coffee and they like smoke these like coffee joint cigarette things they create some really incredible things like 
I feel like when you have nothing but time and when you're bored, that is when you're the most dangerous and that these men had nothing but time and they were clearly very determined. <laughs> yeah. And wow. the most creative. Yeah. They knew how to apply themselves. <laughs> mm -hmm. They wanted to have fun. So, hey. <laughs> yeah. And they were working on other materials, too. But when they made the holes in their rooms, they finished those by May of 1962. And that's when they went to the next phase of their plan. So they started going towards this unguarded utility corridor behind cell block B. And then they would climb Basically, there was like another level above cell block B where they all were. So they found this way to like sneak up to this other level and they created a secret workshop. And there's a picture of the workshop in <laughs> the pictures I sent you guys. That's a lot of space. Yeah, Look at for that. Real. For secret space. That's great. Yeah. Uh, so Alan West had been assigned actually to paint in this area by the guards. So it wasn't a secret area. It just was unguarded. They knew about this area. They would tell Alan to go do assignments and paint up there all the time, uh, but they didn't monitor him. So he just started having all the men go up there and then they could make all their little tools. <laughs> it's like their little their little clubhouse at this point. No girls allowed. So in this workshop, they would take turns alternating shifts with one person working and the other person on the lookout. And they would work from 5.30 p.m. to 9 p.m., giving them just enough time to return to their cells before the last head count. Okay. That's a lot of hours. Yeah. Like, I can't, I can't even go that long without my kids, you know, luring around the the corner at me and being like what are you doing what are you doing let alone guards at the the supposedly toughest prison to get out of are just like letting them have hours of free time in their clubhouse <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny too so trevin when you were describing the heads earlier and you said one of them was pig like uh -huh. okay so they nicknamed their dummy heads and when they made them up in the workshop, they gave them pet names, Oink and Oscar. <laughs> Oink and Oscar. That was John and Clarence's names of their heads. I don't know which one was Oink and which one was Oscar, but I'm assuming the pig-like one was Oink. <laughs> <laughs> I would say. Gotta be the one. Unless they just love irony. <laughs> <laughs> Using a variety of stolen and donated materials, they would build and hide everything they needed to make their escape in the workshop. Among the items stolen, are y'all ready for this? No. <laughs> was more than 50 raincoats from the prison shop where they were manufactured. I don't know why you need raincoats in prison, but they stole 50 of them. <laughs> Wait, was that to make the raft or whatever? Yes, they would create um, life preservers and the raft using these raincoats is my understanding. Okay. And the raft was six by 14 feet. So, I mean, it was a full sized raft and they stitched it together uh, using like some type of treating on the rubber and some technique called vulcanizing. I don't know what that is. They used hot steam pipes in the prison to help, like, weld the rubber together. Like, this is engineering. These men applied themselves. <laughs> yeah, you have to give them credit for that. You can give me a smartphone and you can give me an Amazon profile with all the money in the world. And I would not be able to make myself a raft with... <laughs> with all the equipment necessary. So in one of the men's cells, I can't remember which one, but they, the FBI uh, and the like wardens, you know, they all start searching the cells and they're doing all this investigation. Somebody found this 1960s magazine called Popular Mechanics in one of their cells and that's in the pictures. So they think that this is how the men figured out how to make the raft because in this magazine, they teach you the vulcanizing technique. And so they literally like figured out how to do this because of materials they had access to in the prison. <laughs> They're just going to the prison library, just doing all, all these DIY projects. <laughs> exactly. Sounds like a dream. Sounds like a dream. 
Yeah, you're just asking for an escape. So while they were in the workshop too, they always, they created all kinds of other tools. So those are in like the pictures, wooden paddles, they made like a wrench, they made a periscope and I didn't know what a periscope was actually. So I had to look it up, but those, it's those things in the cartoons that it's like the long tube that goes up and you put one end on your eye and then the other end goes like up another level and you can see up a level. So they used that to like help them sneak out and know if people were coming. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's the, that's smart. I wouldn't even have thought of looking ahead like that on to literally look ahead like that. That's the thing that these men had over a year. So imagine if you were working on a podcast project, like one episode for over a year, you have so much time to think about it. You know what I mean? They thought of everything. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, that sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> I, I did a solo album for six months and that was that was enough as far as putting a lot, a lot into one thing. Yeah. But a prison escape, you do need to take your time with it, I'm sure. I hope you're going to tell us what snacks they packed because they're so damn thoughtful. <laughs> I don't know what snacks they packed, but now I want to know. They had to have had a boat snack. What do you what do you guys think they took? Oh, what's popular in prison? Um, probably like some candy bars or something. Keep the blood sugar going. Oh, yeah. Did they have like some version of ramen noodles back then? <laughs> just eat them dry. <laughs> some or like preserves. pockets full of gruel. <laughs> gruel. <laughs> I honestly wouldn't be surprised if one of them was just like, I'm a man, let's just eat dirt and keep going. Like we gotta, we can't think about food. We ever did everything else right. But they, they probably thought about nutrition. I mean, they're smart as hell. I would think so. I, I think they thought of everything. That's a good point. And they probably, um, when they strung the raft together, I mean, it out, was out of raincoats. And I was just listening to another podcast where they had this raft that had little pockets in it. So now I'm wondering if this raft had pockets because of the raincoat and then they could just stuff whatever supplies they wanted in there. That would be Ooh. cool. Oh my God. I love that. Hidden pockets. Why don't they design women's pants? <laughs> Yes, please. We need we need more pockets and we need bigger pockets. A hundred percent. Thank you, Trevin. That bothers me so much. <laughs> they also created a tool from a musical instrument and took this with them so that they could inflate the raft. So I'm guessing some type of like flute and then they could like blow into it to blow up the raft. So like I said, they worked tirelessly on this for over a year. And by June 11th, they were ready to go. So they left that evening just after final head count. That's how they had the 10 hour head start. But Alan West did not have his ventilator grill in his room completely removed. So the other three men left him behind. Um, oh no. Well, now we know why he was snitching. He was bitter. He's it like, wasn't Guys. a short straw. It was like a, we'll come back for you. Not <laughs> sort of a thing. I know. I feel kind of bad for him because he probably is the one who like gave them the workshop idea and was like telling them when to go and everything. It seems like he helped them a lot. And then they were just kind of like, see ya. <laughs> Did he get in any trouble for assisting them or because he snitched on them? It probably helped him, right? I don't know. I I need to look into Alan West more. That would be that would be interesting. But I couldn't find any pictures of him. Yeah, I don't know if he got in trouble. Maybe not because he gave them all the information, though, because I know sometimes they make deals, but that's all, all speculating. <laughs> mm -hmm. I could see that. So once Frank, John and Clarence would get out of their rooms, they would get into that like workshop area and get their supplies. And then from that point, they climbed up and out of the prison through the ventilator system until they got to the roof. That is like some Disney Channel movie shit right there. Like, who actually climbs through the air vents other than Disney movies? I'm starting to realize that all of these cliche movie things are all just based off of this, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and then they also had... Okay, so I didn't know what these were, but smokestacks is what they're called. The really long ass pipes, okay? They had those at Alcatraz. They were like 50 feet long. And there's a picture, uh, not of the Alcatraz pipes, but just what these smokestacks look like in the slides. So those went from the roof to the ground. So they shimmied down those to 
escape because there's no ladders or anything. <laughs> Ooh, a 50 foot drop. That would be so scary. No, thanks. This was near the back of the building. So once they got down, then they climbed over the barbed wire fence and they snuck down the steep embankment into the northeast shore of the island where they launched the raft. According to Alan West, the men planned from there to take the raft to Angel Island. And then from there, they would swim to Marin County mainland, steal clothes from a retail store, then steal a car and take off from there. Taking off where exactly, we don't know, but that's the extent of what Alan West claims he knew about this escape plan. Left behind to spill the beans. (laughs) (laughs) Why'd you spill your beans? (laughs) And what's unclear after this, according to the FBI, is what happened next, because the only account we have is Alan West, and they never found any other traces of the men. So it's not clear, I know, so it's not clear if the men made it across the bay to Angel Island. Did they cross to Raccoon Strait? Did they go to Marin County? Or did they drown? Because the waters were really choppy and very unforgiving. Okay, so they no one has ever claimed to have seen these men ever Or found again. bodies or anything. We'll get there. Oh, oh okay. I thought, the, I thought that was the end there. I, I know. Okay, I, was I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> this, so this is where, like, the investigation goes cold for a while. Oh. And by a while, I mean 17 years. Whoa. So... They vanished. 17 years goes by. We don't know what happens. We'll talk more about that in just a second. If they crossed the bay, it would have been incredibly unlikely they survived. The raft at some point, because they found remnants of it, they know that the raft at some point had sunk. So this led authorities to believe the men could have had to have swam in the water for some time. And this would have been a high risk of drowning or dying from hypothermia. And on the morning of June 13th, sailors on a merchant freighter reported seeing a body floating in the bay. So this is the day after um, they realized that they escaped. But the body slipped beneath the waves before it could be recovered. So we don't know if they thought they saw a body and it was something else, if it actually was a body, whose body it was. But there was just this one report They never got the body recovered. Yeah, or a mermaid. (laughs) (laughs) I like that idea. So authorities theorized that the men had drowned and their bodies could have been swept out to sea by the current. But if the men had made it past Angel Island to any other nearby land, they could have escaped. But the FBI ended up ruling this out because there was no record, according to them, of any stolen vehicles. So the FBI would work on this case and keep it open for 17 years. And during that time, there was no credible evidence emerging to suggest the men were still alive or in the U.S. or overseas. They would eventually close the case in 1979 and conclude the men had drowned. They then turned the case over to the U.S. Marshals Service, And at some point, they would also close the case. I'm waiting for the however. In the years after the 1962 escape, there were several sightings of the men. Reports of their survival were even offered to the media by their own family members and former associates. So at some point, family members start coming forward and saying that the men did make it out and they did survive. But the FBI has told the public and ruled this a drowning. And they closed the case. They turned it over to the marshals. But it, my whole thing is, like, if you rule it a drowning and you close it, why are you turning it over to somewhere, someone else? Right. So it was really suspicious from the beginning. It was just like, okay, y- y'all clearly are not totally sure. But they were like publicly saying the men had drowned. Does that make sense? Right. That is so weird. You're right. Like, if it's a drowning, then case closed. Why are we still... Sounds like they just don't want other people to, like, check their work, you know? Yeah. And so this is where the conspiracy 
begins. Because remember at the beginning, I said, this is a conspiracy. According to the FBI, no one has ever successfully escaped from Alcatraz, either drowning, succumbing to the elements, being caught, or being killed. But in 2022, so very recently, the marshals would release new information about the case. Because remember, it was handed over to them after the FBI quote unquote solved it. So the U.S. Marshals in 2022 publicly released age progression images of Frank, John, and Clarence. The photos were courtesy of the FBI. Which is interesting because the FBI said they drowned and they closed the case. So why are you making age progression photos if you think they're dead? Right? Hmm. Yeah, that seems like a waste of time to have somebody do that. Probably just an intern who had nothing better to do, who loves his job, doing a little, you know, burning the midnight oil. Really wants that promotion. <laughs> yeah. Federal officials also started asking citizens to be on the lookout. So they released these age progression photos. And these men would be in like their 80s at this point. And they're like, be on the lookout for these men. <laughs> so here's here's where we get to like the information, okay, that, that came to light. So according to Fox 59, there actually was a vehicle reported to be stolen shortly after the men's escape even though the FBI reported there were no such reports. So from what I gathered here, there was some journalist that stumbled across this story and was fascinated by it. They worked for Fox 59 and they start digging into records in this area and they find there actually was a vehicle stolen on the day that the men disappeared from Alcatraz. That's, that's a pretty big overlook by the FBI, I'd say. Yeah, and I couldn't find the exact city where it was stolen from, but they say it's like in the area that the men had planned to go to. So, you know, it could be coincidence, but they they had this come out. And then the other big thing is that authorities received a handwritten letter in 2013. And remember, we didn't hear about any of this till 2022. So nearly a decade prior, Authorities get a handwritten letter. It was handed over to um, or handed over by CBS San Francisco. So I'm wondering if we ever would have found out about this if the media hadn't leaked it. But the letter, I'm going to read it to you. Ooh, okay. Okay. So the letter reads, Hello, my name is John Anglin. I escaped from Alcatraz in June of 1962 with my brother Clarence and Frank Morris. I am 83 years old and in very bad shape. I have cancer. Yes, we all made it that night, but barely." End quote. Um, and then there's some other quotes that say, like, he would go on to say blah, blah, blah. So he would go on to say something to the effect of he lived a full life. He was living in Seattle for a while. Then he went to North Dakota. And at the time he sends this letter, he claims he was living in Southern California. So not far from where he first escaped. <laughs> That's pretty ballsy to return to the state. They always return to the scene of the crime. This letter was the reason that the case was reopened. Wow. Okay. So they got that in 2013 and nobody knew about the letter till 2022. Is that what you said? So the authorities got the letter in 2013 and then it was leaked by someone in the media in 2022. So, and that's also when the age progression images were released. So it seems like they sat on this for a long time, allegedly, and then released everything um, literally just two years ago. And nobody found them? So the writer would explain in um, 2008 that Frank died and Clarence died in 2011. But there, um, there is something we'll get to before that uh, as far as sightings go. So hold that thought. So the letter would also say, if you announce on TV that you've received this letter, 
and that I will be promised first to go to jail for no more than a year and get medical attention, I will write back to you and let you know exactly where I am. This is no joke. So he was trying to make a deal with them. And we don't know what happened after that. Like, we don't know if they tried to make a deal or reached out to him or what happened, but I'm suspecting we'll hear more. The FBI, we do know, examined the letter for fingerprints and DNA, and they also examined the handwriting. But like so many handwriting analysis, the results were inconclusive. I hate that. I hate it when things are inconclusive. Yeah. He probably did it on purpose because he's so damn thoughtful. He's so smart, right? <laughs> yeah, he he wrote funny, like left-handed. He wrote like a and, robot. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so sightings. There was new evidence presented in a 2015 History Channel special show showing an alleged photo of the escaped brothers, John and Clarence Anglin. And the picture was supposedly taken... 13 years after the men escaped, and this is in the photos I sent you guys, Clarence is on the left and John is on the right. In this photo, they are in Brazil, according to the person who took this photo. So the photo was taken allegedly by one of the Anglin's family friends, a guy named Fred Brizzy, and he claimed he ran into the brothers in Rio de Janeiro in the 70s. And he, they like hung out with him for a while. And Brizzy held on to this photo until 1992. He handed it over to some other family members. And then some nephews named Ken and David Widner later handed the photo over to a guy named Art Roderick. So it's going to all these people. Roderick was a retired U.S. Marshal that was the lead investigator on the case for 20 years. So this fell into his lap, it seems like sometime after 1992. But we don't know exactly when. So Roderick would then commission a forensic artist to analyze this photo because he wants to know if it's possible if this is actually them or if it's some type of hoax, if it's someone else. And in y'all slideshow, I've put a side by side of the men's mugshots. So before I get into what the forensic artist found, I wanna hear y'all's thoughts. Do you think this could be the men? I know it's hard to see because they have sunglasses on, but. I could see it. I can see it in the hairline. And I mean, the, the blondie on the right over there. <laughs> I don't remember which one he is, but I don't know. He has that little scowl on his face on both. I could see it. Terrence is on the left and John is on the right. I say yes. So I feel like they look quite similar to them. Obviously, it would have been, according to um, Fred Brizzy, 13 years after they escaped. So they're going to look a little different. But according to this forensic artist, it was highly likely that the men in the photo were none other than John and Clarence Anglin. Whoa, that's huge. Why would they just allow them to take a picture of them. I'd be like, don't take a picture of me. <laughs> also, I wouldn't tell people who I was. Right? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe because they're like in another country, they think that they're like, fine. You know what I mean? Or it's been 13 years, you know, th th so they could slip up. It happens all the time in crime cases, but. Right. And this is before social media. So it's not like they're like, oh, posting on Facebook with the location, you know? It's like they probably took it on a Polaroid. They had to get it developed. You know, it's a whole process. Yeah, I guess my argument is just that whoever took that picture was like, oh, I got a picture and it's these guys, you know? So at least he was familiar with who they were. So it's at this point that the U.S. Marshals develop a theory. They look into Fred Brizzy, the guy who took the photo, and he had a criminal record. They theorize he may have helped the Anglins escape, basically, because they think that the only way they could have gotten all the way to Brazil is like being smuggled on like a boat or something. So I don't know all the evidence they have because so little information has been publicly released. But one of the theories is that Fred Brizzy had access to like a boat or a plane and helped them get over to Brazil. And then he snapped this photo of them, but they had been hanging out a lot more than he, like, let on. Well, if that were the case, then that would make me understand why they would let him take his picture or their picture. Yeah. 
That's true. They're already kind of colleagues. I also just wanted to briefly mention this because I thought it was interesting. So like I said, the FBI had ruled it a drowning. And in the media, a lot of officials would talk a lot about how these waters are so treacherous. They're so dangerous. There's no way these men could have survived, blah, 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 blah. While I was doing my research, I came across this triathlon that is held in these exact waters every single year. And people are able to make the swim. So, right. Like, so that just proves they can do it, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, these men were young. They were in good shape. They shimmied down a 50 foot pole. Like, I think they could do it. <laughs> they, they proved themselves in way or in like many other ways that they were determined and going to make it. Like, they're, in my mind, there was no way that they were going to make the shimmying and build the heads and have a, a <laughs> play area and build all this stuff from scratch just to fail in the water like i don't think so so the conspiracy essentially is that the men escaped the fbi knew they escaped and that they just ruled it a drowning because they couldn't find them and they didn't want it to be like this public spectacle of like this inescapable prison is actually escapable yeah it makes them look stupid totally it makes them look bad yeah so what do you guys think? Do you think the men escaped? Do you think they made it out of the Pacific Ocean alive? 100%. I, I think they did. I mean, like you said, these people doing the, the triathlon can do it. And also, they had a raft for at least part of the ride. So it's definitely possible. Yeah, it's it's kind of like... what What is the... Is that that Bannister guy? The guy I'm going to sound so stupid. The guy who who did like the first was it five minute mile or 10 minute mile running whatever it was and once he did it then many other people were able to do it just because somebody showed that it was possible then other people saw how easy it was and then more other people wow and then other people are able to achieve the same thing because they they have that belief that it's possible because somebody already did it before them i mean the fact that people believe these people do it did it then other people build a whole triathlon based off of it it's probably just the it would sounded unheard of at the time because it was 1962 and they're like who the hell would want to make this swim but i don't think it's like physically impossible by any means it's just nobody really tested it back then there was no such thing well I mean, i'm sure there was but there was no like uh people who just for fun swim 20 miles a day you know that wasn't a thing back then yeah and i mean the one thing i did think about is like in the triathlon they're in wetsuits which would help them stay warm whereas these men would not have been but they're prisoners they're used to harsh conditions these guys were seasoned criminals they had been in multiple prisons you know what i mean so i mean i think i think it's possible they were all in good good shape all healthy as far as we know and also, it wouldn't be the first time that the FBI has covered something up, allegedly. So. <laughs> <laughs> allegedly. That's true. Yeah, I, I, it also just comes down to, I think, survival and adrenaline. I think that also played probably a huge part for them. Like, they were probably insanely determined. So we may never know if Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin truly made history, being the only men to have ever successfully escaped Alcatraz. If they drowned in the Pacific in 1962, if their escape plan and dedication did work and they made it out, working tirelessly for over a year, whatever the case, it is certainly a perplexing story. And that, everybody, is the story of the infamous 1962 Alcatraz escape conspiracy and the story of Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers. Well, that's a lovely story, and I actually surprised I didn't know that much about it. Same. I had never heard of it. Yeah. I'm intrigued. I mean, good for them. Right? I know. I kind of support I kind of stand. Like they were robbing banks and that money was insured. So it's like 
I don't know. I don't really think that they deserved to go to Alcatraz. And also, if they're this brilliant at escaping, they're gonna find a way, you know? And it seems like they lived quiet lives after that if they did escape, so... Right, they just had the one photo ever taken of them in their whole life. I can't even believe that. <laughs> they weren't violent criminals, is my whole thing. So I'm just kind of like, eh. Man, I can't imagine like how many people got fired after that, though. They're like, you guys let these people have a clubhouse? <laughs> These prisoners had a clubhouse and they built <laughs> dolls together and you let them do it? When did Alcatraz close down? Because I'm kind of wondering how soon after that. Oh, that, I don't know. You know what I mean? Oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good question. Oh, <laughs> okay. They closed down March 21st, 1963. They escaped in 1962. Okay. So I feel like I didn't I did not know that they were that that prison shut down that long ago. Okay, so it says online that it did not close because of the disappearance of these men. They say it was because the institution was too expensive to continue operating, but I mean, who's to say? <laughs> Too expensive? Maybe they need to start buying all the arts and crafts for the prisoners. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, I don't know how expensive it would be. It's not like they were highly guarding them. Right. <laughs> oh my God. What are you paying for? Yeah, and it was just a giant dungeon. And the prisoners are painting for them. It's not like they're having to pay people to do all these things. I want to research Alcatraz more, though, because one of the things I was reading is that a lot of the prisoners actually said this was like one of their favorite prisons to stay at because it was like really safe. And the, the men like hmm. felt like they were least likely to get attacked or killed in this prison. But then obviously, like these men weren't really well guarded. So I don't really... I just remember reading that somewhere and I was like, I'm confused why they're saying this and then these men could like go and do all of this. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's just mind blowing. I mean, all I can really say is like good for them. Like I said earlier, I mean, they're not hurting anyone and they clearly were very inventive and creative and they did it. Exactly. Yeah. And they invented a triathlon. There you go. <laughs> uh, you know, it might be expensive to run because of just all the... Uh, supplies they have to keep getting delivered to them being on that island no. maybe mm, maybe that's what it is yeah that's true they have to ship stuff on like a boat yeah maybe some guy put his reputation on the line and was like listen i want to make this island a prison and it, it'll be inescapable i promise and they're like all right but the second one guy escapes i'm cutting funding on this expensive rock <laughs> and then it happens and the guy says i told you i'd do it that would make sense <laughs> No, it's a tourist location. It is. I know. I, and I, I've always wanted to go visit. But after hearing this whole story, I'm like, ooh, now I really want to go. <laughs> I actually, I'm a huge fan of the reality show Vanderpump Rules. And they just yes. went and like Alcatraz was in the background of two of the dudes that are, are just total douchebags on the show. And it's like Alcatraz is right behind them. It was just so mind blowing. Oh my gosh. I'm on um, season nine of Vanderpump Rules right now. I'm trying to like slowly catch up. I have not stopped watching it. <laughs> so before we close out today's episode, I first would like to thank Live Laugh Larceny podcast for coming on with me. Be sure you guys check them out wherever you get your podcasts. Amanda and Trevin are awesome. And like I was saying at the very beginning, their podcast is really unique. It's fun. I think you guys will enjoy it. Be sure also, if you enjoyed this episode, to let me know. You can leave a comment on YouTube. You can leave a comment on this exact episode. If you are uh, listening on Spotify, you can review, subscribe. That always helps the show. You can leave reviews on Apple and write them out. Uh, also, don't forget, I have exclusive bonus content that I release almost every week on Patreon. So if you want to support there, you can check me out. It is much appreciated. Um, all the support links are down in the show notes. So Trevin, Amanda, this was so much fun. Thanks again for coming on. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for teaching us everything about the escape. I loved it. Yeah, I'm glad I learned a lot. Definitely. And like I say every week, you all are amazing. I hope you have a great week and stay safe. And I will talk to you next week.
Bye. Bye. See ya. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Perplexity, a mystery podcast. Hosted, written, and produced by Kadra Brennan. If you enjoyed today's episode, tell the world about it by going to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leaving a five-star review. It helps the show more than you know. Contact, support, and merch links can be found in the episode description. And if you have a story to share or a topic request, send an email to perplexitymysterypodcast at gmail.com. Kadra would love to read your story on the podcast. Until next week, stay curious.